Uh, one learned new techniques uh, from people who were very good at uh, because I don't think any mode of regulation mm. can be considered more or less important. Yes. You would say biology is too complex a subject to be left to biologists. Welcome to yet another uh, super exclusive episode of Beyond Shoot and the show where we dive into the minds of eminent scientists, innovators and visionaries in the domain of STEM research. I'm your host, Dr. Sonia Balyan, and today we have the honor of sitting down with an internationally renowned top leader in the field of peptide biochemistry and academia. Our guest today is none other than highly respected peptide scientist, Professor P. Balram. Professor Balram uh, was the former director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore where he also served as the faculty, faculty of Molecular Biophysics Unit from 1973 to 2014. He is currently a chair professor at the NCBS Bangalore. He is also the chairperson of Ashoka Trust of Research in Ecology and Environment. He has contributed immensely towards the understanding of structural and function of voltage-gated transmembrane peptide channels as reflected by more than 500 research publications and several patents. Professor Balram is a fellow of various na uh, national and international academies. Also, he received many awards and honors in recognition of his work, of which mention must be made of the Bruce Merrifield Award by American Peptide Society, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize of CSIR, Alumni Award for Excellence in Research from IISC, TWS Award in Chemistry, GD Birla Award for Scientific Research, and Padma Shri and Padma uh, Bhushan by the Government of India. He has served uh, on many committees of the government of India. So he was uh, also uh, the member of in, uh, Science Advisory Committee to the Union Cabinet and Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. In today's episode, we will be uh, delving into the mind of Professor P. Balram, exploring his journey from academic curiosity to venerated figure in the world of peptide biochemistry and beyond. So whether you are a budding researcher, or a scientist seeking inspiration, or simply a curious uh, about the future of protein structural biochemistry, you are in for a treat. Join us as we uncover the wisdom, experience, and personal reflections of Professor P. Balram in this enlightening and uh, uh, inspirational conversation. So thank you, sir, for joining us today. And it's it's an honor for us to have you on the show as a special guest for us. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. Start with this interview. Uh, could you please share with us uh, some of your highlights and challenges of your research and professional journey, especially in the field of uh, these biomolecular uh, chemistry or peptide technology? Yes, my professional career really began when I joined the Indian Institute of Science in December of 1973 mm. as a lecturer in mm. the Molecular Biophysics Unit. Mm. Okay, sir. The unit had been started by Professor G. N. Ramachandran, mm. one of India's most important scientists mm. who had done already pathbreaking work on collagen mm -hmm. and on theoretical analysis of polypeptide conformations. Mm -hmm. He had done all his work at Madras University and had moved with his group to Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I was one of the early recruits in the department. Okay. And I was also the junior most uh, faculty member. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was a few months short of 25 years of age. Mm -hmm. The result of this was that I did not know what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. I knew that I should be doing some work in the area of peptides and proteins mm -hmm. because that was the main trust area of the department. Mm -hmm. My very first student, Professor K.S. Krishnan, who is no longer with us, mm -hmm. had already joined the department 
and he adopted me as his PhD supervisor. Okay, sir. And suggested that we work on biological membranes. Hmm. This was a somewhat biological topic with which I was unfamiliar. Okay. But while we were struggling on the to work with membranes, I became interested in peptides which traverse membranes hmm. and allow ions to flow across an otherwise impermeable barrier. Mm -hmm. And this is how I began to work on voltage-gated uh, yeah. transmembrane peptide channels. The particular molecule that I picked out, a molecule called alamethicin, the structure mm -hmm. had just been reported and revised. And in those days, it was a structure determined either by classical methods mm -hmm. or the sequence was determined by methods which were somewhat uh, new and not always correct. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at the literature, I found that this particular molecule had unusual amino acids. Mm -hmm. And this attracted me because I was interested in doing synthetic work. And mm -hmm. I thought, let me start working on this amino acid. Mm -hmm. The major attraction with this amino acid, which I worked on for many, many years mm -hmm was that it had it was two methyl alanine or what mm -hmm. is called alpha amino isobutyric acid or mm -hmm. AIB. There was not much work in the literature, but the feature of this amino acid which attracted me was that it could be easily synthesized from acetone, mm -hmm. ammonia, and sodium cyanide. Mm -hmm. All three were chemicals which were readily available to us in Bangalore at that time. Okay. You must know that in 1973, 74, 75, 76, and mm. so on, when I began, chemicals were in short supply. Mm. Money was in even shorter supply. Mm. And instruments were hardly there. Mm. So one really looked for research problems that one could do with whatever was available. Mm. And I was very fortunate in my choice of problem mm -hmm. because I was able to work on the amino acid AIB mm -hmm. for the next 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. And this is where my it took me through my professional career. I diversified into mm. other areas, but I think this was the starting point. Mm. So, sir, uh, in what subject you have done your PhD? I worked in my PhD on... NMR spectroscopy, okay. uh, which I did at Carnegie Mellon, working on one of the very first superconducting uh, spectrometers in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I analyzed, I did some of the very, very early work on, the, on using NMR to study mm -hmm. proteins and mm -hmm. their interactions with small molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, I later did a one-year postdoc with uh, R.B. Woodward at Harvard, which was in the area of synthetic chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it was synthetic chemistry, which was really my uh, mm. uh, first love. Okay. So, sir, uh, so uh, during your uh, lectureship, you introduced to biology and chemistry. So now the biochemistry. Yes, I learned all my biology uh, on the job. Okay. Uh, I used to attend seminars in the biochemistry mm. department of IASC, mm. which is a very, very good department. Mm. And so you would hear many things. Yes. And then I would talk to people who were working in biology and slowly mm. made many friends. And mm. I learned from them. Okay. So that is very interesting to know that, sir. Starting the area which you are not uh, supposed to be, you know. Mostly people carry forward what they have done in your postdoc. So, but this is a new thing you have just started in your. I, I don't think I began it with any intention. Mm. It just happened that uh, this was what I could do. Mm. And it was an accident completely. <laughs> okay, sir. So, sir, how did you discover your passion in this field? And what drives you to pursue the excellence in your research? And who also some of the people who inspired you or influenced you during these uh, endeavors? See, in my work, I was very fortunate that I began to work on peptide confirmations mm -hmm. at an early stage. 
the department had done pioneering work on the theoretical analysis of polypeptide conformations. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor J. N. Ramachandran was certainly an inspirational figure mm. because he had done some of the best work in India, a post-independence mm. India, mm. and he had done it at Madras University. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brought along with him from Madras some of my senior colleagues, mm. and they were all experts in their field. Okay. So I think I learned a great deal from them. Mm. Uh, I was... Uh, there were not too many people doing experimental work. My senior colleague, Professor Vijayan, had just begun crystallography. Mm -hmm. And so it was an atmosphere in which uh, one learned new techniques uh, from people who were very good at it. Mm -hmm. And I had the advantage, you know, there's a great advantage in being ignorant. Because mm -hmm. if you're completely ignorant, you're ready to learn almost yes. anything. Yes, very, so, very true, sir. I, I was not prejudiced. Mm -hmm. I learned as much as I could about theoretical analysis, as much as I could about crystallography. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do this because there were people around to whom mm -hmm. you could ask questions, who would answer, mm -hmm. and who would guide you. Mm -hmm. So, sir, how do you uh, see that during all your career... How do you see your uh, family support, family values, upbringing and uh, shaped you as a leader in your field? No, I, I'm not certain that your background really matters, mm -hmm. except that I came from a fairly ordinary middle class background. Mm -hmm. There wasn't any other scientist in the family. There wasn't mm -hmm. anybody who really done PhD. Mm -hmm. But there were people who had worked in many other fields. Mm -hmm. My father was uh, a bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. He worked in the railways. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was what you today call a homemaker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and I think they generally taught me the importance of reading mm -hmm. and the importance of working, mm -hmm. So, which I certainly uh, got from mm -hmm. my early upbringing. And since my father was in the railway, he moved from place to place, mm. which I think exposed me to movement. Mm. So I wasn't very uh, concerned about where I was. Mm. Uh, one thing which I could say is that I wanted to come back to India because once I finished my PhD, I thought it's time to go back. Mm. So I began to apply for jobs. And the very first two jobs that I applied, I did not get either one of them, okay. but they were in response to newspaper advertisements which my mother had cut out and sent to me by post from India. Mm. So they would arrive some two or three weeks later. Mm. One of them was for a position at what was then called RRL Jorhat. Okay. And the other was for IIT Delhi, mm. which was a relatively new institution then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't get either of these jobs. Mm. But now when I look back at it, I don't think today I would apply for a job in Jorhat so easily. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. But uh, sometimes it uh, seems like destiny has uh, a different plan for you. So yeah. sometimes you didn't get a thing because you have to accept some other opportunity. Maybe yes, that's... I, mean, just, I mean, luck plays a great role. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, sir, uh, like you have already said about your mentors and all. So who you at, because at that time, uh, as of now, we are having so many role models like you and other uh, in our field. But at your time when uh, not more people are involved in science and technology. So what all those people are there who you look up to or take inspiration from? I would actually disagree with you on one statement that you've made. Okay. I think we were lucky. In those mm -hmm. days, there were many more role models. Okay. There were fewer scientists, mm -hmm. but everybody who went to science went, the vast majority of them went with some passion for mm -hmm. learning yes. and some passion for teaching. Mm -hmm. 
uh, science was not a very profitable or mm. lucrative career. Mm -hmm. And uh, pay scales were low. And therefore, it, bank jobs and government jobs were more attractive. Mm. But you met many people who were very good in their field. Mm. And therefore, many of the senior professors at IISC in those days, I would really consider them as scholars. Mm. And you could learn a great deal by mm. talking to them. Yes. I would not say the same thing today. Mm. Today, you have to really look hard. Yes, to, to find, find that correct person. Yes. To find scholars. Mm. You have a lot of people who are very strongly motivated by career advancement. Mm -hmm. uh, career advancement is different from scientific understanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, one can advance one's career without understanding very much. Mm -hmm. So I think academic institutions are places where scholarship should thrive. Mm -hmm. And I think in the old days, they were role models in different ways. Mm, you know? mm. They didn't publish maybe as many papers. Mm. Uh, they didn't serve on so many government committees. Mm. Um, all of that. Because science was a smaller enterprise. Mm -hmm. So, sir, do you still miss that time? If you compare in uh, today and then that time, do you cherish those days that, yes, we have some quality time that we have enjoyed? At... Well, if you ask me, anybody who's getting old always feels that uh, it was much better mm -hmm. uh, before. That's not what I would say. I think things have just changed. Mm -hmm. I still go to work every day. Mm -hmm. And what do I mean by work? I go to a place... Uh, the National Center for Biological Sciences, hmm. but I occasionally teach a class. Hmm. I talk to people. Hmm. I read and write whatever I want to read hmm. and write. But now today, if you ask me, some of my most uh, educational interactions are with one or two students. Mm -hmm. Because you do find among the student community sometimes people who are deeply interested in a hmm. subject. Mm. And then they ask you questions, they tell you things mm. which motivate you to read more. Mm. So I wouldn't say that uh, the old days were different. I only have to find mm. the only difference is when you interact with uh, much, much younger people, there's a huge generational gap between yes. uh, two. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, one, th one thing which I really uh, observed that... Uh, uh, you have tremendous knowledge about your subject and all, but this type of knowledge we still lack and uh, the generation that is coming after me, they also, because they have lots of resources, but still the interest is lacking somehow. And uh, previously the resources may be limited, hard to, uh, you know, catch up, but the dedication and that passion that have is much more compared to because we are getting easily everything. So not every person is really interested in doing science. Although they enrolled in PhD, but that scientific temperament is somehow, it is not uh, easily available in people. I would not blame here students because generally students who are not very motivated hmm. become motivated by interaction with a yes. highly motivating teacher hmm. i think the problem is more with the teachers hmm. uh, we have very few motivating teachers hmm. and i think this is partly because science has grown so much hmm. see there is so much more information available today than was available 50 years ago hmm. and therefore people find it difficult to uh, digest even a part of this information in their own specialized fields. Mm -hmm. And the pace of life has also become much, much faster. You mm -hmm. can take out your cell phone and uh, look at almost anything mm -hmm. that is available. Yes. And therefore, I think teachers also have a difficult time. Mm -hmm. I think we need yeah. to understand this and ask uh, 
how do you uh, improve the environment of learning? Hmm. So, sir, a part of these transmembrane uh, proteins, what all type of other research areas you have pursued during your tenure? See, my major interests actually diverted quite early on from transmembrane channels to using the amino acid that I had actually initially mm -hmm. found to design peptide structures and to okay. design synthetic molecules which began to look like proteins. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in the area of peptide design mm -hmm. and to understand using design how protein fold. Hmm. This, of course, took me to many analyses of protein structures, which I did in collaboration mm -hmm. with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And slowly I became interested more and more in proteins. Mm. Then I became interested in an enzyme in the early days, triosphosphate isomerase, mm -hmm. which uh, was one of the first enzymes whose gene was cloned in India in the 1990s. Okay. okay. And so it became available for the first time by mm. uh, production in E. coli. Mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot of things studying that enzyme, mm -hmm. which also fed back into my work on peptides. Mm -hmm. But I was always interested in multiple things. So I branched out in collaborations to many other kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, I became more and more interested in biological problems, especially mm -hmm. while I was teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, of course, in retirement, my greatest interest is in trying to understand uh, the processes of evolution, mm -hmm. where you go from chemical evolution to biological evolution. Mm -hmm. How, for example, does... Uh, uh, how would an early cell look like? Mm. How, uh, why is it that two processes, information transfer with nucleic acids and chemiosmosis, which mm. is the basis of uh, energy production mm -hmm. in cells, uh, why have these two things evolved first? And mm. uh, so it is an area in which I read more mm. and try to understand, and then I try to tell it to audiences which will listen. Hmm. So, uh, so, sir, you are doing some uh, research work also on, in that area? I'm not really doing research work in this area. I'm more or less, I would say, trying to integrate information in this area. Hmm. My own research work, which I've been doing for the last few years, is actually to analyze peptide toxins hmm. uh, from corn snail venom. Hmm. And in this process over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I've been mostly using mass spectrometry. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first persons to start using mass spectrometry in India in biological systems. Mm -hmm. So I have been doing a lot of mass spectrometry. Now in retirement, I find it more difficult to access mm -hmm. mass spectrometers and mm -hmm. experiments. So I do a lot of analysis of mass spectrometry information already collected. Mm -hmm. We do transcriptome analysis for corn snail toxins mm -hmm. and then try to integrate it with mass spectrometry. Okay. So, so if you ask me what my current interests are, I would mm. say it is uh, to analyze toxins, uh, mm. mixtures by mass spectrometry. Mm. Great, and to sir. And base reactions. Great, sir. Finally, you find your passion in biology. <laughs> yes. So, sir, con uh, uh, related to that only, as you are also interested in that biological system are incredibly complex and with various regulatory events occurring at different levels. Uh, so in uh, considering the uh, the so-called central dogma, over the time we have also seen and uh, that we have different regulation modes at the level of chromatin, then transcription, then translation, and then uh, you are pioneer in protein uh, biology. So in your opinion, how would you um, see that the priority wise, uh, which regulation uh, could be more important or to get a holistic picture, one should look from all these aspects? It's difficult to answer this question because I don't think any mode of regulation mm. can be considered more or less important. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
however, you might ask a more simple question. Mm. You might ask, how did regulation actually evolve? Mm. Now, if you ask the question of how did regulation actually evolve, you have to ask the question of how did biochemistry itself actually evolve? Mm -hmm. And at what points in time did regulation become uh, important? Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask this question, you can see that we don't know anything about the first cells. Mm -hmm. We don't know anything about what might have been the first cells evolved. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. There's one field in which more work has been done in biology than any other, mm -hmm. and that is in the biology of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on mm -hmm. cancer research. Yes. But I would draw your attention, this was, uh, my attention was drawn to this book by someone who heard one of my lectures, who's not a scientist, but a poet. Mm -hmm. And she wrote me an email saying, why don't you look at this book, which is written by a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And this is a book called The First Cell, mm -hmm. written by a Pakistani-American scientist working at Columbia University called Azra Reza, who mm -hmm. has asked this question that after so many years of cancer research, we still don't have better treatments for cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And she spent her whole life on this. Mm. So she's written this book saying we should be asking different questions. Mm. So the question that she poses is an evolutionary question. How did the first cancer cell actually evolve in your mm. body? Mm. You know, cells are turning cancers all the time. Yes. They are taken care of by mm. killer T cells. Mm. Huh? Mm. Sometimes when that mechanism doesn't work too well, they proliferate more. Mm. But the question is, what are the signals which make these cells, the first cell mm. appear, the first malignant cell? Mm. But if you extrapolate this argument to other areas, you're actually asking questions about the first cells. Mm -hmm. And it is useful to try and understand which are the simplest mechanisms available to sustain life? Mm. And only as life has become more complicated, yes. do you need a regulatory mechanism? See, in prokaryotes, you need regulatory mechanisms largely for metabolism. Mm. But when you go to eukaryotic cells, you need regulatory mechanisms for more things. Mm. Then, more, then more complex eukaryotic cells now begin to make... Uh, uh, tissues and so on, you've got very many more things yes. to regulate. So I think uh, we should try to work our way uh, upwards now. Mm -hmm. To There are two ways of doing this. One is to work your way downwards. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you wanted to study all the uh, proteins in the cell, mm -hmm. you would do what is today called top-down proteomics. Mm -hmm. You can also do proteomics bottom up. Mm. Uh, so in your thinking, one can be bottom up, up which is an evolutionary approach, mm -hmm. or you can be top down, mm -hmm. which is you look at the world as it is mm -hmm. and then work your way in. Mm -hmm. Biology is a very complex subject. Very complex, yes, sir. And in many ways, I would say biology is too complex a subject to be left to biologists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, definitely, definitely, sir. You know, because, <laughs> because uh, if uh, if the integrated approach will be there, some uh, because uh, the areas which a bio uh, a chemistry people uh, point out is not handled in uh, in the required way by a biologist because somewhere down the line uh, their understanding is limited. So, but when different peoples with different understanding and domain comes. Uh, they will generate new knowledge. That is definitely there. See, for example, in the institution where I'm now spending my time, the National Center for Biological mm. Sciences, they have a group which is studying, uh, which calls itself a physics and biology group. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very interesting to hear them because the kind of questions they ask yes. are completely different from the kind of questions you would ask mm -hmm. if you were trained in biology or yes. trained in chemistry. So when you hear these, you get uh, uh, an idea that every subject of science mm. in some way feeds into the understanding of uh, the mm. world around us. Mm. 
Hmm. Yes, sir. Right, very correctly said. Because now we are having uh, these uh, NGS technologies and now we are having these next generation sequencing technologies. Also, artificial intelligence is coming. Then we have uh, translatome and several other things are there. So, uh, what is you are expecting from future technologies to uncover uh, regarding science? What is your expectations that should be... Uh -huh. I, I would I would pose a question both to you and to whoever is listening. Mm -hmm. You see, when the if you look at the scientific advances of the twentieth century, the twentieth century began with Planck and the quantum. Mm -hmm. It ended with the announcement of the human genome sequence. Mm -hmm. Now we are twenty three years since the human genome sequence was announced, mm -hmm. and a huge number of genome sequences are available. Yes. We have still to sharpen our questions, which we are going to ask of the data. Mm -hmm. And only when you ask good questions of the data, are you likely to get good answers. So systems are very complicated. So what exactly is happening? We have so much of information, but then to again extract that one meaningful information is very hard. It is now maybe easy because you have so much, but that one meaningful information that is, you know, replicated and then uh, generate some uh, solid proof of concept is still, I think, uh, we struggle a lot in that. So you have not posed the question in a simple way. Mm -hmm. If you pose the question in the simplest possible fashion, it would be this. Is the reductionist approach, which has been used for a mm. hundred years, going to yield better insights into biological processes mm. than the more integrated systems approach that is now being taken? Mm. Mm. Now, when you collect all this data, you are finding it difficult to integrate all of it. On the mm. other hand, if you study a single protein, you focus on that yes. protein and its functional roles. Mm -hmm. When people who are doing gene regulation particularly, when they say that uh, in response to some environmental condition, mm -hmm. 100 genes have been upregulated and 100 genes have been downregulated, mm -hmm. you can make little sense of this. Mm -hmm. uh, see, most of us who are working... Uh, you can ask the question, if you're a chemist, you can ask this question. Uh, how many friends do you have? You'll mm. find you have a handful of friends, mm. maybe 10, 20. How many names can you remember? Maybe 100. Mm. But with how many proteins can you now be friends? Mm. Not too many. Mm. So if you want to understand them in detail, you really have to go back to a more mm. reductionist approach. Yes. There is a uh, tension now in approaches to biology mm -hmm. between people who advocate a reductionist approach and people who advocate a systems approach. Mm -hmm. So today, systems biology, synthetic biology, these are all very popular terms. Mm. But it's very difficult to pin down people mm. on what they mean by these terms. So, sir, and, uh, in, in your opinion, which is uh, a better approach to deal to a problem? I think the problem should actually be looked at. See, what is the problem that you want to know? Mm. I'll give you an example. An example is in some recent work which I've read in the literature on uh, what is called sudden death syndrome in mm. which babies have died in, in the crib. Newborn infants, one-year-old infants, mm. a little bit older. And the cause of death is not known. Mm. There is this one very specific case in which one lady had four infants who died one after the other. Mm. After the third infant had died, people became suspicious. And after the fourth infant had died, she was tried for murder. Mm. And she was sentenced. And I think she's been in jail for 20 years now. Ooh. And she always said that she never did anything. Mm. Now... People who have pursued this case, they have done genome analysis. 
And having done genome analysis and these children's DNA was available, they have done genome analysis and they've now found that the children all harbored very specific calmodulin mutations. Mm. And calmodulin and calcium fluxes control the heart. Yes. And so you, your heart can suddenly stop. And they all had mutations. Mm. Now she has been released. But oh. you can see now that we came back here to an observation, but eventually it's been traced to a single protein mm. and a major legal problem has been resolved. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very, very unfortunate that this kind of thing should happen. Mm. But this should be a lesson to us to see that there are many problems that mm. we can solve with these new techniques, yes. provided we know which problems to study. Mm. Blindly collecting 1,000 genomes or 10,000 genomes uh -huh, mm. isn't going to help you. Yes. So, sir, uh, as you are having uh, a remarkable journey as scientist and a leader, could you please share with us any specific event or discovery that you can say that that would be the uh, turning point, point of my career and shaped the path of your research? Well, really shifting the path of my research was the work that I did right at the beginning when I started. Mm -hmm. And I did have this uh, little peptide that I then made. One of my students, Dr. Nagaraj, who later had a career at the Center for Cell and Molecular Biology, he joined me as a PhD student and he made this short tetrapeptide and we were studying its structure. Mm -hmm. In those days, the general feeling was that short peptides do not have well-organized structures. Mm -hmm. But this peptide, when we studied it by NMR spectroscopy, appeared to have a very well-organized structure. Mm -hmm. And I did this with rather primitive NMR methods which were available then. And I submitted the paper to the Journal of the American Chemical Society. And the referee at that time said that uh, there wasn't sufficient information on whether the molecule was actually the correct molecule or mm -hmm. not. Mm. And therefore, I should do now a chemical analysis to get carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. But chemical analysis was difficult to do at that time because the analyzers were not working mm. in the, at IASC. So I came upon the problem of trying to determine the molecular weight. Mass spectrometry was not available mm. at that time, even abroad. And so we determined the molecular weight by an old method, which is measuring the density of crystals. Mm -hmm. After measuring space group dimensions, this was possible because my colleagues, they were crystallographers. Mm -hmm. But once my colleague, Professor Shamla, she was a postdoc then, she measured this. She said that it's diffracting very well. We can actually actually solved the structure. Mm -hmm. so I said, why don't we solve the structure? She solved the structure. And sure mm -hmm. enough, it matched with what we had expected from NMR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were able to publish this. This taught me then the power of crystallography immediately. And okay. I began to then always try to do crystallography. Mm -hmm. And I think this really helped uh, the kind of problems in which we were working in, in mm -hmm. design in those days. And mm -hmm. it stayed with me for the rest of my career. Hmm. But I was not a trained crystallographer at all. Hmm. What kind of outreach activity we really should look up to or focus on uh, to inspire the students, uh, the young minds uh, towards research and all? See, the only outreach activities which I am familiar with are lecturing outside in hmm. different places. Hmm. Uh, whether it is in colleges or universities, wherever, mm. occasionally with even younger audiences. Mm. The other is to write. Mm. But nowadays people don't read very much. Yes. And therefore writing does not reach. Uh, lecturing also reaches only a limited audience, the audience mm. which is seated, seated in front of you. Yes. And you need to do a lot of it. Mm. I think outreach needs to be done locally. Mm. But I think science 
scientists, senior scientists, administrators of science also need to worry about something else. If we encourage more and more people to do PhDs, mm -hmm. we do not have jobs available for yes. them. And jobs are beginning to get fewer and fewer. Mm -hmm. And people can't only work in research institutions. Yes, They need also to work in universities and colleges where teaching is a major component. Mm -hmm. So I think if people don't like to teach, and in my own opinion, if you don't like to teach, you're unlikely to be a good researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that if you can teach, you may not be a good researcher. Mm -hmm. But I think to be a good researcher, it helps if you're able to teach a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, science has become a profession like every other profession. Yes. And today, if you get a job as a scientist in a government lab, or you get paid reasonably well. Mm -hmm. So it is a career to be sought after. Mm -hmm. But I don't think true progress is made if everybody views science as only as a career. Mm -hmm. They must also be interested in it. Yes. That is... Uh main key to sustain in science if you love or you have a passion for research and teaching then you can happily uh, do your uh, role so that is important sir and so sir uh, as you have experience in india in one of the top institutions of india and also abroad so uh, in your opinion how can we make our institutions uh, to the top research institutions in the world? And secondly, uh, what all improvements or policy we need to improve when it comes to make India a choice for the international community to come and do uh, research and uh, pursue research? For, for example, uh, many of our students, they uh, prefer to go out for postdoc. And uh, uh, so when we see the that that kind of diversity in Indian institutions. What all policies are still lacking to make this happen? You know, I think as far as policy is concerned, I would say I'm very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. I don't see any policy being made by government which promotes research in a true sense in all our academic institutions. Mm -hmm. I I think trying to make our institutions compare with the best in the world is a good aim. Mm. But we must also be realistic. Which country are we comparing ourselves to? Mm. We are comparing ourselves to the United States. Mm. By and large to the United States and the United Kingdom. Mm. Britain and America are the two points of comparison. Oh. Mm. We are not comparing ourselves with Russia or we are not mm. comparing ourselves with China or anything, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Now, today, for example, you can ask the question, Chinese institutions are doing pretty well. They've yes, they are also doing well. Yes. Uh, do foreigners want to go and work in China? Very few. Mm. You don't want to go and do a PhD in China. Mm -hmm. hmm? On the other hand, everybody wants to go and do a PhD uh, in America or yes. a, do a postdoc in America. Mm -hmm. Now, America is a different place. Uh, if you People come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's got enormous diversity. Mm -hmm. And it gets the best from all over the world. Japanese, Europeans, mm -hmm. Indians, Chinese, Australians, everybody. Mm -hmm. You can't compete with that diversity. Mm -hmm. That diversity of expertise, that diversity of thinking, and so on. Now, you're a country, however, which is largely exclusionary, mm. you know, because we are not, we are poor. We are not a very rich country. Mm. You may say whatever you like, mm. but out of the 1.4 billion Indians who are there, maybe a billion Indians are yes. poor. 400 million Indians may be all right. Mm. Okay. So we have our own constraints. Mm. So I think sloganeering is not going to get you anywhere. Mm. Now, 
take students coming in. It would help in India in our institutions if we got students coming from other developing countries. Yes. If we had students coming from Africa, mm. Latin America, and all, they don't have to come from the United mm. States. Do we make conditions easy for these students? Mm. No. We okay. make conditions very difficult for these students. Okay. First of all, they won't get visas. They won't be allowed to stay here for five mm. years. And at every step, there will be a hurdle, one way or okay. the other. We'll have conditions where they have to report to the police every six mm. months and things like this. Mm. So we have lots of constraints because of the system in which we are. After they come, do we integrate them immediately? No, we don't. Mm. We are very conscious. Uh, see, India has become very conscious of homogeneity. Mm -hmm. and very reluctant to accept diversity. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why we even worry about getting st foreign students into our universities. Mm -hmm. We have difficulty getting our own people from one place to the other, isn't it? Yes, yes. It is only in national institutions that you have some diversity. Mm -hmm. But in state institutions, you have very little diversity. Mm -hmm. So we have many more fundamental problems uh, which are difficult to address. I think what happens in India is this. Sloganeering takes, uh, is sometimes confused for solving problems. Mm -hmm. To solve problems, we may have to work for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, beyond your lifetime also. Mm -hmm. But we must work towards it consistently. It may happen one day. So, sir, because uh, you are, you are, and other uh, top leaders, they have, they are in the position where you can, uh, you know, put up these questions and uh, maybe uh, make the government to uh, do work on in that area. No, I don't think one can ever really advise. Government never wants. A, government would like advice. to confirm what they already want to do. They already know what to do. They have a way of mm. doing things. There's a limited amount that government can also do mm -hmm. because, you know, funding is restricted. You can't make every place in India mm. now a wonderful place. Yes. See, we have our problems. They are economic in nature. Mm. They are social in nature. They are political in nature. But they are mm. complex problems. Mm -hmm. Just as biology is complex, <laughs> uh, running yes. India is also very complex. Yes, yes it is. So I wouldn't really blame uh, mm. uh, anyone. We are very good at blaming uh, people. Mm. But no, it's just the problems are complex and takes time. So this this issue, na, what you are saying that we are very good at blaming. This is uh, in my podcast interview, I am uh, now uh, getting this issue again. One is with my another guest who are also saying that we are very reluctant to take responsibility. And we always say, Achha, ye usne kiya hai. <laughs> ye usne kiya hai. Yes. That, that is the main problem. When we take responsibility, what we are doing, then things will become more. See, I would like to use, I would like, because you're doing a podcast, I'd like to have people think about this. Mm. The most important word which I like nowadays is the word evolution. Mm. Everything evolves. Yes. And when you look at biology evolving from absolute simplicity, mm. chemical mm. simplicity, to such enormous complexity, mm. you can ask what about other things? So everything evolves, cultures evolve, policies evolve, countries evolve. Mm. But evolution does not proceed uniformly in a direction of progress. Mm. Evolution is actually where systems adapt to their environment. Yes. The danger in India today is that we have an environment and if the system adapts to that environment, it is stuck in one minimum. Mm -hmm. It will take some effort to get it out of this minimum to go to the next better mm -hmm. minimum. So you do have uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. You think That's about true. something which so many people worry about today, culture. Mm -hmm. and you ask yourself, when did culture first enter uh, human thinking? 
humans were there. No, they were just like animals before. Mm. They were hunter gatherers. When mm. did culture evolve? Mm. And how we has culture evolved completely, or will it continue evolving in future? Mm. And my guess is it will continue to yes, evolve in the future. It will definitely. Sir. Except that the time scale on which we look at evolution is a very mm. long time scale. Mm. And our own time scale is very limited. Mm. Your time scale and my time scale will be the our lifetime, mm. which is only a few decades, mm. which is very short. Mm. And sir, uh, one uh, more thing like uh, what we have in uh, these top institutions like NCBS or we have uh, some uh, like in Delhi and uh, some major cities, the infrastructure is very well. But most of the students, they are in university system and there the infrastructure and the uh, what all we have the environment or the ecosystem that uh, will favor research and all these innovation it is not very favorable so how can uh, these top institutions collaborate in uh, the smaller institutions or the university to provide them the uh, infrastructure or support so that they can also uh, you know, uh, gain that momentum and uh, allow that kind of ecosystem uh, to thrive. Is it possible? Maybe collaboration or some sort of... Uh... I, I think it is certainly possible mm. because uh, it is certainly possible uh, because I think Institutions which have a lot of infrastructure have some level of obligation to make facilities accessible to others. And I think mm. they try. Mm -hmm. But what has happened in India now is that money for maintaining facilities has become much less. Mm. And I think institutions struggle in this. Mm. We also have a major, uh, what I would call cultural issue, Mm. Most scientists in India in the area of biology, chemistry, and so on are not really very comfortable with the technologies that they are using. Mm -hmm. And sometimes instruments are purchased with very few people available to actually run them, mm. to interpret data coming out of them possibly, mm. uh, properly. And uh, Therefore, you can find instruments lying idle all over yeah. the place, including in universities where mm. government has been kind enough to give money. Many programs have been there. Mm. Mm. There are more uh, underused mass spectrometers and NMR spectrometers mm. and electron microscopes in, in India mm. than one, should, one would like to see. Mm. So I think we also need to be more sensitive in the scientific community to the importance of keeping instruments working all the time mm. and making them available and accessible to the maximum number of people. Yes. And how to do this is we need to discuss. I've never heard a discussion. Mm -hmm. So that way, uh, the people who don't have the facility, they can also, you know, they can have that uh, option to carry forward their ideas or uh, innovation yeah i could give you an example the indian institute of science long ago when it was a much smaller place mm -hmm. had what was called a short-term worker program mm -hmm. so you could apply and come from a university and spend as much as six months okay and i've had as many students who came and spent six months they'll go back again to the university for two months and come mm -hmm. back again for six months which was okay. actually a and not the best way of doing things. <laughs> oh, yes. But as far as the student was concerned, it was one mm. way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And they did use the facilities. They did get their PhD degrees. They did move up in life. Mm -hmm. So I think these were good programs. Mm. Because but, you in know, they're very small programs. Mm. So, sir, uh, uh, what is your message to the young student or budding scientist who are listening to you right now? No, I don't have really any message except to say that you must be interested in what you do. Mm. And uh, it will turn out that during the course of a career, you drift from MSc to PhD to postdoc uh, 
because of a number of circumstances. Mm -hmm. You will do a PhD wherever you get admission. Mm -hmm. And then wherever you get admission, you will work with whoever happens to be taking a student. Mm -hmm. And then when you go for a postdoc, you will go to a place where you got a, a mm -hmm. postdoc. So many times these are not what you might have chosen, but you mm -hmm. go there and you gain experience, you learn mm -hmm. techniques. Once you've done all this, you must work on problems which truly interest you. Mm -hmm. And you must get interested in whichever subject you're doing. Mm -hmm. Your uh, career path may take you to subjects which you did not know of at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But uh, every time uh, you come across that, you must learn to like your subject. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't use the word love, but you must learn to love your subject also mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. Then only you will have the energy Hmm. To continue reading, uh, you see, when you can do nothing else, which is there, for example, for someone like me who's hmm. retired, uh, I still have considerable energy. But if I have, how do I control my energy? I can only read, no? hmm. right? Read more, hmm. and uh, that uh, comes only if you are engaged in what you're doing mm. and you must be a lifelong student yes that uh, that is at no point uh, does learning stop mm. uh, so sir are you satisfied with your journey or you still have something in your mind that this this much pro uh, problem or uh, area i need to explore or this i should have done it is there anything still no, left? Can, no, I don't think one can have regrets of that kind. I think what one needs to have is only to ask the question, what mm. am I going to do tomorrow? Mm. <laughs> and what shall I do the week after? Mm. And uh, go ahead and do it. Mm. I so, don't think one should have any regrets about anything. Mm. But then you'll spend all your time regretting something or the other. <laughs> So, so still you plan your day out, sir. What I am going to do next? Uh, I don't plan. I'm not, I'm not a very good planner, but I read indiscriminately. So sometimes mm -hmm. I get in with the idea of reading this, but end up reading something else. Mm -hmm. But I still, uh, yes, I collect very many more papers. I download all the time, mm -hmm. and it's easier to download than to read. Mm -hmm. So. Take some time to read. Uh, yes, sir. So, sir, thank you so much because today you have enlightened me and all different type of perspective of looking at a problem and also asking question. So, thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.